Hello, and I hope you're enjoying Time Space Visualizer today. Our next guest, sadly, you can't enjoy her contribution to Doctor Who, as of course the Myth Makers no longer exists. But it is an absolute joy to be talking to Cassandra herself, Frances White. Thank you for joining us, Frances. That's fine. Glad to be here. Hello to all the Doctor Who fans. So how are you in these strange times? Okay, is about the best I can manage, I think. Yes, I'm, I'm okay. I'm of course having to really isolate because I'm 81 now. So I have to have food brought and stuff like that, which is really driving me up the wall um, because I hate asking for help. But everyone's wonderful. So, you know, it's, it's fine. And I live in a very pretty place um, near lots of areas of outstanding natural beauty. So there's really no problem about finding somewhere to walk, which I do every day. Oh, sounds like the, the perfect spot to be then during all this. Great neighbours, lovely countryside. Yeah, it's nice. Oh, brilliant. But I imagine you never expected during all of this to be talking about a job from almost 50 years ago. Well, no, not really. I mean, if you'd asked me 50 years ago, I would have said, well, I just sort of popped in, done a quick kids programme <laughs> because I rather fancied acting with, with Daleks. And I was just about to get married and it was happening in London, so I didn't have to travel and it just the dates just fitted. And I thought, yeah, it'd be fun to do a thing with Daleks. And then of course when I got the script I realised it wasn't Daleks, it was the Siege of Troy. But it was still fun. So so when your agent first spoke to you about it, it was there's a part for you in Doctor Who. And the conversation yes, no mention, on. no mention of no Daleks, no. And I mean, I did watch Doctor Who, and I thought, yeah, Daleks, great. But then there weren't any. But it was a show that you were quite keen to work on then. Yeah, I thought it'd be fun. And was it? Did it live up to that expectation? Was it good fun? Well, there were no Daleks, but apart from that, it was quite good fun. Yes. <laughs> I did have very many, very, I mean, I have some clear memories of it. Um, one is arriving to the rehearsal room and being taken aside by one of the assistants who pointed out a terrible, tatty armchair in the corner of the rehearsal room and said, don't, whatever you do, sit on that. That's William Hartnell's chair. So I looked at it and I thought, there's no way I'm going to be sitting on that anyway. <laughs> uh, he was, could be quite grumpy. Then I watched the programme years later and discovered that he had some, something wrong with him and had terrible trouble remembering the lines. So he must have spent the entire time in total misery, being scared stiff the entire recording. And so I really felt retrospectively very sympathetic. But how did you uh, find his, his companions, so Peter Purvis and oh, Robin O'Brien? No, everybody, everybody else was not grumpy. Everybody else was great fun, yeah. The other thing I most clearly remember about it was my costume, because I was a high priestess, had, um, was held at the shoulders with pins, which stuck up. And apparently, according to the costume designer, that was a historical thing. And because I was a high priestess, the ends of the pins had poison on them so that nobody could come and casually slap me on the shoulder or do anything kind of disrespectful. I thought that was great. I enjoyed that bit. So did you do much historical research at the time or was it sort of all there in the script? No, I didn't do a lot. I mean, I knew about the Siege of Troy anyway because I used to quite like Greek mythology. Yes, I didn't do anything like as much historical research on that as I have on some other things I've done. So, but, uh, despite the fact there was no Daleks, was it quite nice to find yourself in a story that you already had an interest in then? Yes. Yes, it was. I very soon got over the Daleks. Do you remember anything of the director, Michael Leaston Smith? No. That was 50 years ago. <laughs> and I did, a, round about the 60s and the 70s, I did a tremendous amount of work. So, I mean, yesterday, before I did this, I went and looked at my scrapbook, which I haven't looked at for a long time. And I sort of thought, my God, what a lot of stuff I did. 
Am I right in thinking this would have been your second television role? No, no, I'd done quite a lot before. Definitely done a lot before. I got, um, I left drama school in 1960. I went to the Central School of Speech and Drama, left in 1960, went and did, well, it was a prize actually, but, um, but the leaving um, performance, there were various prizes, which I won a few, and one of them was six months in Dundee which was a fortnightly rep, which was quite grand really in those days. You had a fortnight to learn the lines. Um, and uh, it also meant I got my equity card, which in those days was like gold dust, because it was one of those strange things where it's not like that now because you can't have a closed shop. But in those days, you couldn't, get an you couldn't work until you had an equity card. But you couldn't get an equity card until you worked. So it was the prize really was actually the equity card and six months experience, very good rep. Then I came back to London, did a few little televisions, because I'd won the Associated Rediffusion, which was a television company in those days. I'd won their prize, so they actually found a job for me as a nurse in something or other. And, and then I got a call from my agent, who I also won, as it were, by, by doing well at the final performances. And um, he said, there's a part in, they, they had a thing called, I don't know what it's called now, Playhouse, I think, something like that, where they, they did adaptations of novels and they were doing Marguerite Lasky's Victorian Shays Long, which is almost entirely so centered on the woman in it. And he said, they've asked for one of my clients who's not available. So I said that you would be good to, would be good to see you. So I spent the night before reading the whole of Marguerite Lasky's Victorian Chaise Long. And there's a bit of it in which the same, the character has a conversation with himself. And I thought if I was doing an interview piece, I would pick that. So I really paid a lot of attention to that. And the interview piece was the conversation between the two halves of the same character. And I got the job, although I was totally unknown. So I got discovered, discovered early, really. And I didn't stop after that. So that was in 1962. But, but that first part, was that quite nerve wracking? You know, not only is it a, a good part, but it was also on television, which was a new medium at the time. Uh, no, I just remember it being very exciting, really. I really enjoyed it. It was more nerve wracking than it might have been because by that time we were doing, television was being recorded so if you made a mistake, you could go back and do it again. But for some technical reason to do with the BBC's contract with, maybe with Marguerite Lasky, I don't know. Well, that didn't seem to be her idea. They weren't allowed to re-record, so we had to do it like it was live. Now that was a bit scary. Was then I went on to do another one for the same director in the same, the same series called The Imbroglio. And then after that, I really didn't stop doing television. And I did a West End fit to print with playing Donald Wolfitt's daughter. And in 1964, I did a, I went into the West End with Severed Head at the Criterion. And then I did a film, Pumpkin Eater, playing Peter Bancroft and Peter yeah, Anne Bancroft and Peter Finch's daughter. A lot of them were adaptations of novels, you'll notice. You know, a lot of these things are adaptations of novels, which is always great because they give you the thought processes. You don't have to do the working out what people are thinking at any one point because it tells you in the novel. And then I did pump, oh, I did pumpkin eater, yes. And I did, um, then, then after I'd done all that, I did episodes of Doctor Who. So in fact, Doctor Who was really a very light bite, you know, when I did it. I did it because it fitted in and it looked like it might be fun. And, and so, you know, you talk about some of the other things, but all of these productions at the time had a fantastic cast. And in Doctor Who, you had the joys of working with Barry Ingham and Max Adrian. Had you worked with them yes. before? No, no, I hadn't. No. But you, in, a, in a lot of the, the soundtrack that still exists, you seem to spend a lot of the time telling off Barry Ingham. And there does seem to be a wonderful... I told everybody off. 
Well, because nobody would listen to me. They wouldn't listen to me. I mean, if they'd only listened to me, things would have been very different. Yes, I was, I was quite feisty, Cassandra. Yes, it would have been a much shorter story had they listened to you. It probably would, it have, would have been, been a much shorter story if they listened, yes. Right. But I mean, it must actually be infuriating to know that you're right about something like that. And have, I mean, suppose somebody said, look, in December, somebody said, look, there's a terrible virus coming our way. We have to prepare. We have to be sorted out. We have to have the hospitals sorted. We have to have everything sorted. And nobody took any notice of you. You'd be a bit cross now, wouldn't you? Yes, you certainly would, you know, and that comes across fantastically in, in the audio of the story. It would just be nice to see some visuals together with it one day. Yeah, yeah, it was quite pretty in those days. <laughs> I have photographs. Obviously, there are photographs. I have, and on the photographs, it's really surprising how completely patty um, the post box is. Because it was, it was not a big budget affair. It was, it was mostly really for kids, I think. In fact, one, one or two people, I think, were quite surprised that I watched it and that I was sort of a fan of it anyway. So I suppose at the time it went out, you'd have been busy working. So did you ever actually see it? Oh, yes, of course. Yes, I did watch it. Yeah. Yes, I'm one of the few people who's probably one of the few people alive who's seen it. <laughs> you never know. Maybe one day the myth makers will be returned to us. I think it's a bit late to hope for that. Don't you? Don't you think it would have been? I don't understand why we've got the sound and not the vision. How did that happen? So, so at the time, uh, fans of the show recorded the audio oh, from the I'm television. Oh, All right. Yes, because of course we couldn't actually record video record because in those days you couldn't. Um, well, at least I didn't have a video recorder in those days. So uh, maybe somebody will turn up an old recording. But I should think by now it's so sort of moth eaten, rat nibbled, and all the rest of it, it wouldn't be worth watching. Yeah, well, I suppose we just have to see what. what time brings us but uh, on that note and uh, talking about the joys of celebrating BE Day I shall let you get on and celebrate today thank you very much for your time Francis. It's a pleasure bye <laughs>